and welcome. Did you hear someone say make it rain? <laughs> to the Man Enough podcast. Wow. I'm Justin Baldoni. I'm Jamie Heath. And today we have a very special guest, a dear friend of ours, Mr. Rain, Rain Wilson. Rain Wilson. Dwight uh, True. Rain from The Office, um, also founder of Soul Pancake, which uh, I just want to say, if it were not for Rain and his vision, mm. um, there's no chance that I, I don't think we would be here right now. Uh, I started making documentaries about people who were dying uh, my last days on Soul Pancake. They were the first to believe in me. So big shout out to Rain and Shabnam and Goalrees and Devin. You guys, uh, the OGs of Soul Pancake, I appreciate that. And here we are. So let's talk about what we're doing right now. We are having Rain Wilson on. Yeah. Why are we having him on? Because he's done a lot of things that I think are worth uh, discussing and for other people to hear about. He is a man that I admire, you too as well. He's helped both of us a lot. He, he has indeed. He, uh, He's, you credit him to kind of saving in many ways your life. He was one and, of the people that saved my life. And indeed. my marriage. He also um, has a wonderful um, um, organization called Lee Day Haiti, mm. where he they do incredible work. Incredible work, champions the work of women and ladies. And so, uh, Rain, I think, is an example of somebody who really has dedicated his life to being of service. And he's used his fame and his notoriety and his influence to really make a difference in the world. And now he's tackling climate change and we're and, gonna talk about a whole lot of stuff. And he has screwed up a bunch. He's been a mess. He's been a mess, he's screwed up, but he owns it and he talks about it and he talks about it with his kid. And, and so he's worth talking to. He's more than worth talking to. Indeed. He is. So if you like what you hear, follow us at manenough.com slash podcast. One more time. Manenough.com slash podcast. And we'll be right back with the one and only Rain Wilson and the we're wonderful about, Liz Plank. Mm, we're about to make this, it rain. Oh my God. This is Man Enough. <laughs> Say make it rain one more time. Make it rain. <laughs> <laughs> hey, everyone. Don't you think the word slow is just right? Like if you're describing a relaxed vacation or a sloth, or if you're describing QuickBooks, more like slow books. Yeah, that's right. I said it, slow books. I mean, who wants to be slowed down with manual processes, integration difficulties, glitchy delays, all those things that leave you scrambling for the numbers you need. So now is the time to make the switch to NetSuite by Oracle, the number one financial system. Because NetSuite gives you visibility and control of your financials, your inventory, HR, e-commerce, and more. It's everything you need to grow all in one place. And with NetSuite, you can automate your processes and close your books in no time, no matter how big your business grows. But failing to switch to NetSuite will leave you stuck trying to make sense of your books while your competitors sprint ahead. But check this out. Right now, special financing is back. NetSuite is offering a one-of-a-kind financing program only for those ready to switch today. Head to netsuite.com slash man enough right now. Get special financing at netsuite.com slash man enough. Again, that's netsuite.com slash man enough. Welcome back to Man Enough. I'm Justin Baldoni here with Jamie Heath and our wonderful co-host, Liz Plank. Mm -hmm. And we have a very special guest today. My dear friend, Jamie's dear friend. I can only imagine how much I'm gonna get made fun of. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Mr. Rain Wilson, Liz, do you wanna read some awkward oh, bio in front of, read some bio. of Rain? Do, I can't I'm, wait to I'm hear his bio. Rain Wilson's bio. Can we how talk exciting. about his life? Rain Wilson, um, you played the clarinet and the bassoon in your high school band. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You still You it. went vegan in 2018. Yeah. And <laughs> own a zonkey. What's a zonkey? What's a zonkey? Yes. Well, uh, there's a there's a donkey component, and the uh -huh. Z is a there's a zebra component too. Okay, it's a zebra mixed with a donkey, because that's what I thought when I read it. But yeah. that's really yeah. a zonkey. The spermatozoa of the zebra mm -hmm. is in interfaced with the mm -hmm. the womb wombishness oh, of the donkey, and wow. it creates a little hybrid. <laughs> I wow. can't. No, really. Wow. <laughs> That's uh, can exciting. I leave? I, I don't want to be here anymore. I want to see a photo of a zonkey. That's mm. all I. That's all I we want. We have right now. plenty of photos of zonkeys. Okay, yeah. great. He does. Yeah. Okay, and they're real. great. They're beautiful. In fact, I brought it in. So can we bring in the zonkey? 
Mm -hmm. um, so look, Rain, you're a producer, you're an activist, you're one of the funniest people <laughs> on earth. Um, you have been working in film and television for so long and um, we all know you for your incredible performance as Dwight Schrute in The Office, uh, but you're you're so much more than that. I You're my favorite Super Soul Sunday uh, episode with Oprah. I love where you say, thank you, Oprah. I can't believe I just said thank you, Oprah. Uh, <laughs> you really are a fan. Oh, like you're totally. like a legit fan. No, totally. I, I've been playing it cool this whole time, uh, mm -hmm. but I am so wow. overjoyed to be here with you I'm a and fan. to all be here to be talking about you and your life and also your definition of masculinity, manhood. What What is it like? Wow. Well, I will say to start things off that my wife said, oh, you're going to go do the uh, Justin's Man Enough podcast. She goes, if you cry on this podcast, I'm divorcing you. <laughs> oh, that's um. <laughs> Reinforcing. Right. Oh. Let's just reinforce. Have you ever Come cried on, in front holiday. of your wife? Oh my God. I've okay. cried so, so many, many times, times in front okay. of my wife. Hold on. Holiday was joking. Holiday She's is. She's joking. Okay. She's Holiday's a superhero. When's yes, the last time you cried in front of your wife? Um, I'll be really honest with you. It was probably a week or two ago. Mm. Crying. And this is, this is right in the, this is right in the, the zone of mm -hmm. the man enough uh, show. Mm -hmm. And, and that was crying in gratitude that um, I'm with her and that mm. we've had a, th a 30 year relationship and I'm so grateful for for being her partner. Wow. Mm. Yeah. Wow. And did that come out of like a specific moment or it just No, we were, walk we were occurred. walking the dogs. I think I probably just picked up some poop from the sidewalk <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. and, uh, and and burst into tears. Yes. <laughs> I had a deep, yeah. deep moment of connection. Yeah. I love that. It's in those regular little small moments, isn't it? It's in the nothingness. Mm -hmm. uh, Okay. We always start with this question. When yeah. was a time you remember not feeling man enough? Um, I think the first, uh, maybe uh, first 18 years of my life. <laughs> <laughs> but then does that mean boy enough or, or mm. male enough? Mm. No, I guess because this isn't, for me, this is an interesting topic because yeah. um, I read your book, the pre-publication version of your book, Justin, is wonderful. And... Um, and you were so vulnerable in the struggles that you shared. And, um, but honestly, I didn't relate a whole lot because I was always just so nerdy and geeky growing up yeah. mm. that I didn't have any kind of like, there was never any struggle of like, oh, this is the, the kind of man I need to be or anything like that. I was in- You were confident in your nerdiness. I was confident in my nerdiness. We were a bunch of nerds. We played Dungeons and Dragons. I played the bassoon <laughs> and I had this weird sense of humor and a giant head and, uh, <laughs> you know, and, and it's in suburban Seattle in the eighties. And uh, I didn't kind of feel like, oh, I wasn't in sports. I didn't need to like compete. I mean, of course I had, you know, massive insecurities and stuff like that, but it didn't, it didn't, go so much with like manhood. Now, you know, when you get into like dating and women and rejection and stuff like that, there's a whole other kind yeah. of layers mm -hmm. of, of stuff, but I didn't have that struggle of like, uh, I'm, I'm feeling less than- Wanting to than be accepted by the other guys. Yeah, and because, because we were just, we were the nerd posse and we mm -hmm. just, anyone was accepted. So it didn't yeah. matter. So there's something really, but see what's funny is the only time I felt that in my entire youth was when my junior year in high school i like took a sabbatical from trying to be cool and hanging out with the sports guys and i hung out with the theater guys mm -hmm. it was the only time i felt like yeah. i was enough as i was mm -hmm. like that yeah. i felt accepted and liked and, and, I, and i questioned all my life decisions like why didn't i just do theater why didn't i hang out mm -hmm. with these guys we made stupid like this when jackass was big we made mm -hmm. all these videos and we, i could just be an idiot and a nerd and they liked me for it mm -hmm. and right. everybody was different and the posses that i hung with now you know, it was it was pretty rough and tumble in suburban Seattle in the in the early '80s. You know, and I got pushed around a lot mm -hmm. and mocked a lot and bullied, straight up bullied. But uh, mm -hmm. anyone was welcome. If you want to join the chess uh, team, it doesn't matter if you're on the spectrum. It doesn't matter if you're gay. It doesn't matter if you're ugly. It doesn't matter what race you are. <laughs> it doesn't. It just doesn't. It doesn't matter. And it was yeah. the same in the theater too. Yeah. And you know, all sexualities were welcome and. Um, in people of all stripes, it didn't matter what you looked like. Mm. And that's, that is a wonderful thing about being a theater geek. Yeah. Mm. 
It mm. feels like you, so I have probably already said this on this podcast, but the patriarchy is a pyramid scheme, right? For men, particularly. Women know the patriarchy is like, I mean, some women still participate in it and think they're going to get something out of it. I think a lot of men think, oh, cool, great, this thing, I can get to the top, right? I can get the approval of the football, I mean, whatever yeah. that is in high school, whatever right? That football is. team or quarterbacks or, and then later it's, you know, later in life, I don't know who that was for you. Uh, or maybe you never actually seek that approval of that 1% of like men that are sort of quote unquote the right race, the right um, sexual orientation, um, have the right body. Uh, do you do you feel like you never were trying to get up that ladder? Well, again, for me, it was more about uh, I was trying to be an artist. I was trying to build a career as an actor. Mm -hmm. uh, so I certainly wanted approval, right. you know, but I wanted approval uh, so that I could get ahead and get the next job or get a better agent or something like that that I needed to do to, to, to advance my career. But it, it never was really about like I need approval from men. But mm. until mm. really like I would say the first time I really bumped heads into that was a little bit in L.A. in, Holly, in the Hollywood mm. world where, yes, it's very diverse but there is kind of this kind of like guys, dudes network kind Ooh. of behind the scenes. And even I think a lot of like the uh, the kind of quote, quote nerdier like comedy guys mm. that were nerds in high school are now multimillionaire, super mm -hmm. popular kids. And so they act, they just inherit mm -hmm. how the, the popular kids and jocks in school in the lunchroom yeah. act. Mm. And are you welcome at the lunch table mm. or not? So there's these hierarchies. And, and that did affect me for a long time and really ate away at me. Like, why am I not at yeah. the popular kids table? When I was in high school, you could, I didn't care. Yeah. I didn't give a shit yeah. if I was at the popular kids table because wow. I knew I would never sit at the popular kids table. But all of a sudden, as I'm making it as an actor and I'm mm. on the office and I'm doing some movies and stuff like that, like, why, why do I not get to play with the big boys mm. of Hollywood comedy. Like they don't accept me or want me or, but so, but again, it's not, a, it wasn't a masculinity thing. It was more, but yeah. there was a lot of ego involved, but it was mm. more about ambition and success. But is that though, like, is it not a masculinity thing or is it? Well, I mean, I think, and then that's kind of what I think about when I think about like, okay, so it, it's almost like you guys or you when you were younger or maybe nerds or people that identify as nerds or geeks or whatever, self-identify, mm -hmm. feel like, okay, I'm never going to be that. So I'm comfortable being this. But is mm -hmm. there a part of you that like, if you, if a genie came the next day and snapped their, you know, their fingers or whatever, you would like and offered you the chance to become that, would you? And then is that what Hollywood does? Overnight, you just become that. Suddenly you have money and fame and then all the geeks now suddenly are losing weight and getting ripped or getting hair plugs or all the things that happen then once you become rich and famous and you're now funny and good looking and then you're back at like oh i'm now the cool guy that was impossible to be when i was younger i feel like there's there's got to be some connection with masculinity and what i experience in hollywood too which is very much that like i'm like shit I'm not cool enough. Does anyone feel cool enough? Like, is there a guy in Hollywood that feels cool enough? Matthew McConaughey definitely feels okay. cool enough. For, I, we just had Matthew, Matthew on the show. <laughs> he I feel like it. Matthew McConaughey feels cool enough. So I have a, a thought. So Rain, mm -hmm. you, you and I have known each other for a long time mm -hmm. and and um, super close, spent a lot of time together, intimate time together, traveled a bunch together. Mm -hmm. And I have been personally um, on the floor, on the ground at my lowest low, mm -hmm. um, with you at my side during that time. Mm -hmm. And what I've seen in you, which is interesting about like this whole, we've been like trying to undefine what it means to be a man, right? So you may don't have this bravado, this whole thing about being accepted by the boys and all that. But we certainly walk through the world like um, trying to redefine ourselves, be better for our sons, how yeah. you are with your son. And what you do well, and I wanna know why you, you do this, is you're in therapy all the time. Mm -hmm. with yourself, with your family, like you just acknowledge how helpful that is just for being a better person. You're constantly being accountable just for your actions and um, recognizing where you're flawed and you know, and, and all these things. Why do you think that's important? Do you think that's tough for you in any way to um, be vulnerable with those things, to not have to like prove that I'm, you know, man yeah. enough that I don't have, because you do that well. Yeah. You um, called me out on my shit and, and allowed me to do it. Yeah, and you know, I certainly have my struggles, and I think, uh, you know, 
When I was really lost in my 20s, um, when I look back on it right now, I kind of have a new take on it. And that is, I was really struggling with mental health issues. That's mm -hmm. really bottom line. Uh, in my 20s, trying to make it as an actor in New York City, uh, I had wicked bouts of depression that were incredibly debilitating. It, it was much less diagnosed mm. in the 90s than it is now. Mm. Um, and I had crippling anxiety and I would get these anxiety attacks that would literally leave me in the fetal position on the floor, like shaking. Mm -hmm. And this was on and off for years. And there was addiction issues. I would try and kind of quiet that anxiety with alcohol and drugs and pretty much everything else that you can try and use to quiet that anxiety. That didn't work out very well. So this therapeutic process for me has been like, you know, um, I had a pretty traumatic tr childhood and this is gonna take a lot of ongoing work for me to be continually like unpacking that, but also um, bringing my best self to bear uh, in, in adult reign. And I just feel like people kind of make a big deal about therapy, but why would you not spend 50 minutes a week Here's your week. Here's what you do in a week. How much time do you spend watching TV, playing video games, watching sports? Jamie. Playing golf? Jamie. Hey, hey, hey. How many hours a week do you spend that? And you don't spend, and someone wouldn't spend 50 minutes a week to yeah. just examine themselves and to kind of take stock and look at your patterns of behavior and what you can shift going forward, try and uh, understand yourself a little bit deeper. So it's a, you know, it goes hand in hand with. Mm you know, uh, mental health issues and addiction issues and stuff like that. But it also, uh, it, I just feel like it's a, it's a very worthwhile investment. And how did being in therapy change your relationship to women, change your relationship to your partner, for example? Um, that's a great question. Um, it's, it's ongoing, you know, I think that, you know, Jamie, like the stuff you brought up before about, you know, where my strengths have been, I'll tell you where my weakness has been in my own entitlement. So mm -hmm. there's obviously a lot of talk these days about kind of white privilege that has kind of gone part and parcel with who I am. And then, and then you're a man and then mm -hmm. you're, and then all of a sudden you're this geeky celebrity and then you're given kind of all this kind of love and accolades and attention just for being yourself. But then you walk in a room and people are like, oh, uh, you know, mm -hmm. and you're given all that. And so I think for me, there's there's been a tremendous amount of entitlement that went with that, a lot of ego struggles around that. So I think my wife got the, the shit mm -hmm. end of the stick around a lot of that um, and uh, was not treated uh, with near with the respect that she warranted. So there was some rough years there. There were definitely some rough years and, and the therapeutic process has been really healing for us. Um, you know, we've been in, in couple, we're not in anymore, but we were in couples therapy for a long time. And, and how uh, did it show up with her? I'm curious, like the entitlement, the ego, like how did it show up in your, in your relationship with her? I think, um, uh, you know, in the 12 step program, you go one day at a time. I think mm -hmm. in a relationship, you go one day at a time and slow things down and mm. just make sure that I'm never ever taking her for granted. Yeah. So uh, that's hard because that can show up in so many ways and it can show up in just little ways, the that, little you, ways yeah. that you talk to each other mm -hmm. and disrespect each other. Mm -hmm. And so all of this work that you do, whether it's spiritual work, psychological work, mm -hmm. recovery work, all of this work is just for one thing, it's to stay more conscious. Mm -hmm. It's just yeah. to be more present and more conscious with the choices mm -hmm. that you make and how you interact and react to the world. So I want to be more conscious in my interactions with Holiday and treat her with the respect that she deserves. Mm -hmm. So also, let me ask you, what do you feel that you do differently raising a boy, raising a man? He's a young man now, mm -hmm. 17. Mm -hmm. um, that maybe you didn't get, that you know that he needs to have, like new lessons, new learnings that you have gotten that you think yeah. Need to happen for that's humanity. a that's a great question that feeds right into what we're talking about and that is my dad was a wonderful man uh a brilliant artist very kind very sensitive there was not any kind of like kind of he-man great santini aspect to my dad at all which i really uh respect i know that he loved me deeply but his emotions were kept in a lockbox. i mean mm -hmm. anything having to do with feelings was like in this giant safe with five or six locks on it brrr, wow. uh, spun around and just and locked away and he could he could be gentle and he could say you know i love you and 
how are you today? But anything, if you ever asked him, like, how are you feeling? How does that make you feel? Anything? Just boom. Mm. And he had a super traumatic childhood. He has one of the most traumatic childhoods I've ever heard in my life. And I've heard dozens and dozens just like horrific. You can't even. Can believe. you go into detail? What like if if you want? Well, I, you know, his, um, for instance, like how his mom died. Um, his mom had tuberculosis mm. in the in the forty late forties, early fifties, and they went to go pick her up from the sanatorium, and they went into the courtyard, and she was up in the window and waved at them and ran to go get her coat and meet them downstairs. And she fell down and hit her head and died. Oh, God. oh my God. So they were going to go get his mom <clears throat> and like, and then she died like that. And then mm -hmm. his dad was an alcoholic and had, there was a series of really abusive like stepmoms that came and went from the house and mm -hmm. he would, they would be left alone for weeks at a time at age like 11 in his house to have to like try and steal food from neighbors and borrow oh food gosh. from neighbors. It mm -hmm. was like, it was really, really bad. It was like kind of like a, you know, a Dickens, you know, novel yeah. or something, Oliver Twist stuff yeah. to mm. it. Um, so he never felt safe sharing emotions. So that's what I get mm. to work on with Walter, age 16, and say like, I want to be a feelings guy and I'm going to share my feelings with him and I get to hug him. And Do you feel resistance with that though? Do you feel like, do, do you feel any challenges in trying to open up and share those feelings or is it, does it come really natural to you? It's something I have to work on. I wouldn't say resistance, but it doesn't come natural at the same time. Something yeah. again, in a daily practice, I kind of have to remind myself, okay, stay conscious with Walter and check in with him and see how he's doing and, and love him and share mm -hmm. my heart with him. And one thing that I always do, and this is, and I think this is a really cool kind of takeaway is one thing I've worked really hard on doing is when I have struggles and when I have failures, I share them with Walter. Mm. So it's like, hey, I was up for this big part in this movie and blah, 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 blah happened and I didn't get it. Whatever. That's a pathetic example. But say, and, and here's how it makes me feel. And wow. I feel rejected and I feel lame and I feel sad and I was really looking forward to it. And, you know. It's such a service you're giving him with that. We had my dad on not long ago and we... And that was, I, it was like an hour cry session with me and my dad, but that was one of the things I just wished he would have given me, is he never gave me his failures. He never gave me, he was emotional, but not vulnerable. So I never saw, I never saw his flaws. Mm -hmm. And so I, he was, in, he was impenetrable. He was perfect, right? And then you fall from grace eventually, but you're giving him that. So he's going to grow up and be able to say like, oh, well, I can feel those things too. And that's mm. a gift, man. Mm -hmm. Good mm -hmm. for you. Mm. Thank you for doing that. Yeah, And I'm curious, I want to go back to this because you and Holiday have such a gorgeous relationship. I was having cold feet. I had already done this stupid, elaborate proposal. And I, like right before we were going to get married, I was like freaking out. I was absolutely freaking out. And I called Rain. I was, and I'd never really been vulnerable with you before. Like mm. I, I was making like documentaries for your company, mm -hmm. for Soul Pancake. And mm -hmm. so like you were kind of like, Rain Wilson, you know, so I called Rain and I like, I thought he was gonna like make fun of me a little bit or like, but on that call, he was like, oh man, I really, like he heard me and it was one of the most, it was like one of the most profound, special, simple moments. And it did so much good for me where you, bas you basically told me um, that I was being an idiot. You called me on my shit and t talked about my ego. And in Baha'i Faith, we have this concept of the ego being like the evil whispering one, right? Mm -hmm. And this sense of self. And he was just like, hey, man, like, that's not you. That's not you. That's your ego. And in such a Rain Wilson, like Oprah profound, like conversation, it was like 15 minutes. It was done. And I was like, I think I'm okay. And I went back inside. I talked to my wife about it. And I will forever be grateful for that. No, and that's nice. I was, I don't know, I was 27 or something. And, mm. and it just meant so much to me. Yeah. Thank you. I put you in the book. I yeah. said, my phone a friend is Dwight from The Office. He uh. provide this service for uh, other men uh, that, he, I, anyone, that I date? Anyone. Yeah. Anyone. Let's okay. give out my phone number. <laughs> he does. He does. In fact, in fact, going on that, other men, you may have single-handedly saved my life. Because mm. he's the one who called me out when I was in my um, denial and ugliest state. We've known each other for years, but we weren't like intimately close, but we'd known each other, you know? Mm-hmm. And I get this email from him that was like, um, 
dude. And he listed all this shit about me and called me out. It was like, so if you ever want to talk and hang out um, and get real and have a real conversation and be a real man, not hide, call me. And I was like, what the fuck is this? I got really <laughs> pissed off. <laughs> Didn't respond. And then um, it got a little bit lower. And then I recalled this thing and I called him. And uh, we went and had coffee, lunch. And I just, there was the first time I like let all my shit out. I had told anybody the, of what yeah, I had. You laid it all out. I laid it all out. Wow. And, um, and then what he did was um, he heard it. And he was like, now you got to be accountable. Mm. Wow, yeah. It wasn't like coddling through it. It was like love. And the way the love was there was, all right, now we got to get you from here to here. And here's the steps. Mm. And um, so be, if had that not happened, I don't know. I could have stayed there. This is so interesting because I think that women in our friendships, because the patriarchy doesn't punish us for connecting with other women mm -hmm. in the way that the patriarchy punishes men for connecting with other men. Women often in friendships will be like, I'm worried about you. Mm. I'm worried about this this person you're dating. I'm worried about this job you're doing, right? Mm. I, I, I get those all the time. <laughs> A lot of people are worried about me, okay? <laughs> but but it, it, it's just part of female friendship. And I get the sense, tell me if I'm wrong, that it is not as much a part of male friendships, that what you, Rain, had, have done for Justin and uh, have done for Jamie is... I am worried about you. Mm. Here's why, and here's, you know, and, and again, with the accountability on top of it. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, first of all, again, bringing it back to a woman because I'm the only woman here, it would make women's lives so much better if men did that for other men. Yep, So Amen. that we don't have to, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm curious, um, did other men do that for you? Like, is that something that other that that was modeled for you do am i making any sense do you feel like it is not as frequent yeah. for men to do that it is not as frequent for men yeah. to do that absolutely and um men don't risk making themselves vulnerable in that mm -hmm. way and and truly you know one of the things that's really i'm sidestepping it a little bit but saying that one of the really difficult things in this day and age and i don't know if it ever existed before is for adult men to make new friendships. Yeah. yeah. So we have our friendships with like our high school kids mm. and the, maybe we went to college and people we worked on in our careers early on in our careers and that's kind of our stable of friends. But like, it's super, super hard in your 30s and 40s and 50s to kind of like meet a dude that you relate to and like form a friendship. And you know, why is that? Why, yeah. why can't there be, you know, you meet someone, you have some stuff in common, you have lunch or something like that and say, Hey, do you want to be friends? <laughs> and like, and say, how are you doing today? Yeah. And um, let's go to. Do you want to go to dinner? Yeah, let's go to dinner. dinner. Do you do that? Yeah. Do I do that? Yeah. No, I don't do that. <laughs> but it seems like you're a really good friend. What are your tips for men who might be listening, looking to be a better be friend? He makes fun. He makes fun of us. Okay. Yeah. That's mock one of mercilessly. Mock mercilessly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Tip uh, number two. Yeah. No, I, I don't I don't know that I'm that good at it. I know you're super humble, but I think for a lot of men it is challenging. They they want that connection that you have with Jamie, that you have with Justin, but they don't they've never been yeah, they don't know how to taught. get it. So I in my book give advice, I give little tips, uh, right, that uh friendship is like a garden, right? You gotta water it. You know, it, it's about how much you tend to it that, mm. that really matters. Um I say this very simple thing of, you know, being a good friend. I think a lot of people feel like they need to be cool and like interesting, but it's actually about like listening, mm. like it, being a good listener and asking good questions. Like people will want <laughs> to be your friend. Mm. Uh, I'm curious if, if anything comes to mind, just in the way that you've approached male friendships. Well, I think one thing is, I think texting is awesome, but I think it's kind of the devil because yeah. some people like only text. And back in the mm. day, Back in the 90s, yeah. uh -huh. well, going way back yes. to the old Faxing. 90s, we would fax each other nonstop. <laughs> we would just say, hey, thinking of you today, smiley face emoji. Maybe <laughs> bring <laughs> back the fax. Yeah. Um, I miss faxing. Uh, yeah. But we would pick up the phone and be yeah. like, beep, bloop, 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 bloop. We knew mm. people's numbers. Hey, Kevin, how are yeah. you? Oh, hi, Rain. What's going on? Yeah. Hey, what's going on in your life? Mm. And we would talk mm. with, not like, sup, bro. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. check out the game. Yeah, awesome. Mm -hmm. Later. Mm. So I do think that making uh, 
uh, lunch dates, beer dates, coffee dates, uh, seeing someone face to face, uh, FaceTiming, like taking yeah. that time to kind of like have a connection and a conversation. Mm -hmm. It's it's hard to do, but uh, and it sounds obvious, but people don't do it. Right. Yeah, it's about time, investing time. It comes back to what you're talking about mm -hmm. in in terms of therapy, right? Making if if you want good friendships, it's kind of like any you want a good body, you want to. But there's also you know you have to. Invest. But there's also something, and that I think it's okay to acknowledge that makes it uncomfortable and hard for us to do it. I, I, I know that I feel a certain resistance, and I talk about this in, in my book, like a resistance to like, just go have coffee or just go have dinner. Like we talked about, like Jamie and I have never had dinner unless it was on the way back from something. Like we don't just go have dinner. What do we do? We go work out. We'll go like on a hike. We'll go do something active. We work, we, we work out. You and I don't work out. Okay. But, but now we work together, so we're just with each other all the time. But there's always something that we're doing. It's like the shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder yeah, friendships, right? right? Like, right, like right. in bars and things, we're always sitting next to each next other to and looking at something or driving in cars or whatever it is. But there is something, and that's what I think that's the masculine, that's the mm. invisible barrier that like keeps us right. from staring into each other's souls. But that's what Rain's saying, right? Like this idea of shoulder mm. to, men do shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder friendship and women do face-to-face -face friendship. You said FaceTime call right mm -hmm. there's no there's a basketball in between us it's just you and me and we're looking at each other we're talking to each other so in a mm -hmm. way what you're i think proposing is this more face-to-face -face, right where rain is good yeah and i don't know why you have this maybe it's just is you do have one-on-one -on -one time like and i've told you this a lot of friendships are built in the nothingness yeah when there's just nothing happening you're not like playing tennis or doing this where you spend time we're looking at each other we'll say some prayers together We'll talk about like what's going on in your life, you know, um, have real, real stuff. I don't want to keep bringing up my old shit, but you also are the first, you're the one who said, when I shared with you some of my history in my childhood, you cried for me and said, that should have not happened to you. Mm. And you got angry and you got pissed mm. and you were like, I'm mad that you are not mad. And you now let me, now let me double check you right here because when you told me that and I cried for you and I was like, Jamie, I am fucking pissed off that you, they did that to you and treated you that, and you defended them. You'd be like, well, it wasn't that bad. And, um, oh, mm. my parents, this and this, and it, you know, it wasn't blah, 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 blah. And then late cut to <laughs> three or four years later, when you had kind of dug in a lot more, you were like, I am so pissed at these people and what they did to me. And, mm. and you started laying it out. You were able to access those emotions. So, and I think that's natural. It you is. know, we're dealing with yeah. trauma. Like at first we, we defend the people mm -hmm. yeah. and we don't want to kind of like allow ourselves yeah. healthy anger. But what I'm speaking to is okay. your, your ability though in, in friendship to hold that space, which then allows men to grow. I feel mm -hmm. like it's great that you're a part of the man of conversation because people listening, um, I feel like you, um, it's weird to say this, but you model in your life um, and, and exemplify some of the ways that I think more people could adopt. Yeah. Well, you know, so we're in this weird phase in our country with like masks, right? And this whole segment of the country that doesn't want to wear masks mm -hmm. because it in, quote unquote infringes on my freedom. Mm -hmm. I don't want to not go to a bar. I don't want to not wear a mask. This restricts my free, this I, weird idea of freedom. Mm -hmm. When actually what freedom is, is like people not dying <laughs> and people being healthy mm -hmm. and you know, coming back to a healthy, vibrant economy where we're helping each other. Mm. And when I wear a mask, it's because I don't want some 90 year old woman to die. Mm -hmm. It's not about me. It's mm. really about that. And mm. we're also in this moment right now where, and it, it's been for a while about, um, you know, what is a healthy masculinity? How do you, and I'm sure you've addressed this on the show and in your book, there is something wonderful about being a man and there's something wonderful about being competitive and independent and, um, and self-assured that can come for both women and men, but there's something wonderful about manliness. And at the same time, all of this toxic stuff has got to go. And so I, I, my question for you guys is like, mm. um, so the toxic stuff, we've already covered some of that, you know, it's intimacy, it's expressing emotions, it's being a better friend, it's kind of having a face-to-face -face friendship, not a side friendship, it's, um, you know, sharing our failures and our struggles with our children, et cetera. How do you describe this shift that needs to happen in masculinity mm. without saying like, we need to feminize mm. 
masculine the masculine because well, that's what, that's that's, what a lot yeah. of people really react against like yeah. right. i don't want to be feminized it's the same kind of reaction of like i don't want to wear a mask because it yeah. restricts my freedom right, right but in a sense isn't that what we're talking mm -hmm. about like bringing um but that's also rooted in so when they say that and that's that language is important when when men say like the feminization of men like i've been called that a lot mm -hmm. like oh he's just trying to like make us all x mm -hmm. right we're really saying we're making men weak which goes back to the whole issue of mm -hmm. like that sexist language which is like feminist right. feminism f being like yeah. female is weak yeah no one tells women no one's worried about the masculinization of women right like i mean some well, no, people a lot are. Of men are no 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 men no, are. Some, but it's are, not but... it's not a moral panic no. in the way that it is right. and has been for years where you know our 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 men there's a war on men right in this country and our we're turning them into soft. women because we are expecting things like compassion and mercy right mm -hmm. which we had uh, we're gonna have glennon doyle on the podcast you know she talks about how when did come i mean first of all why is compassion feminine like why is mercy feminine why mm -hmm. is nurturing feminine why have we ascribed right these are made up right we, we, we we've re really ascribed certain traits and characteristics and we've we've made two buckets and we've said this is masculine this is feminine mm -hmm. and that's where we get into trouble and your point about masks is so interesting because we've seen especially at the beginning of the pandemic men were more vulnerable to COVID, right the most at-risk demographic at the beginning of the uh pandemic were people of color uh and people of color are still more impacted by the disease it, it's also older men and so men were dying more of COVID, but they were less likely to wear masks, right? Mm. And if you go back to the Spanish flu, 1918, mm. men were also less likely to engage in hygiene, right? These, the, there were campaigns that were, you could look back at these amazing cultural artifacts of campaigns that were, that were trying to convince influence men, men yeah. in, influence men, exactly. Mm -hmm that social hygiene that and again they were talking about like blowing your nose with your handkerchief like these you know sort of um mm -hmm. archaic things that we, we we don't necessarily talk about anymore but, but they were branding that as patriotism there was a whole campaign that the government tried to do and i just you know i think we've and been we've recently that done more. that you've heard that you've heard you know that's been said wear yes, your mask it's patriotic it's strong, we're literally yes. going back in time 100 yeah, and if you think even like about the virtues, uh, these quote unquote virtues of masculinity, uh, if we are to believe in the two buckets, protecting, right? Protecting is pr providing and protecting are the two most important ones. Mm -hmm. Why isn't wearing a mask? You're, you're literally protecting other people. You're protecting the people that you love. You're protecting your community. So why is that feminine, right? So it's like, it's all just... And somebody made it up at some point in time. Someone said, oh, wearing a mask is for whatever. And then everybody now thinks, or at least a group of people now think that if you wear a mask, you're that. And mm -hmm. so then you have this like invisible, stupid, made up thing where we're all <laughs> abiding by these social laws mm -hmm. that don't make any sense. Mm -hmm. Because if you think about it, and it's it's similar to like caretakers. Being a, a, a caretaker is, I believe, if you want to talk about like masculine things, one of the most masculine things you can do. Yet 40% of all caretakers don't admit that they're caretakers, right? And are also suffering silently. So you think about like the traits that make us masculine, which is really kind of the point of what the book is, is why aren't we using those traits to then like undefine it and then say, well, like, yeah, let's protect. Let's protect the the 80 year old woman that you might walk by and wear a mask, right? Let's save a life. That's heroic, isn't it? But like we get so caught up in like the whoever decides it. And that's my problem with masculinity. Nobody knows where it started. Where who's, Who came up with the, the fucking rule? I mean, the, who, who said the I can't look <laughs> into the eye of this beautiful man's like soul here and say, Rain, I appreciate you. I've never been called a beautiful man yes, before. Have. <gasps> but now who said that? Why do I feel that thing? What's the thing that causes me to feel awkward when I like, like, why don't I ask you to go to dinner? Hey, Jamie, let's just have dinner, you and me. Let's go dress up and go to dinner. Let's go put on some nice shoes. We, I mean, we can't do that anymore. We do it with our wives. With, but you and me, we always need someone else there. Mm -hmm. You guys go to dinner, and I'll, I'll pretend to be the waiter. I used to be a waiter. I could be a great, I could be a great waiter. I could. You're not. Would you, menu? Menu? Can I get you anything to drink to start? You would not be, you would not be very good. Sparkling is still? I was a great waiter. I bet you, you were would great. would not be very good. I, I bet he was great. I think, no, I, there's no chance. You would have forgot by the time you went back 
You would have forgot something. <laughs> you would have got distracted with something else. There's no chance you could have no. been a good waiter. I think no. Rain's the kind of person that if he focuses on something, he's, he's brilliant. He's brilliant at many things. I don't believe a waiter would have been. Brilliant. I was a really Wait. good waiter. Yeah. I was a really, I was said, I was like actor one, waiter number two. Wow. <laughs> the best yeah. thing I've ever been. What was, the, what, was yeah. the, what was the most tips you got on a night as a waiter? Oh, I've made hundreds of dollars mm. in, in a night as a waiter. I don't know, two, three hundred, three hundred dollars. And with like inflation, that. that's like five, six hundred. Yeah, this is we're talking a thousand dollars a day. That's the nineties. Yeah, oh, that's it was good. like ten thousand dollars. And sometimes the most distracted waiters. I, I was a very distracted waitress, but because of ADHD, you you you're very focused on one thing, so you can be very focused on the people yeah. that you're with. It's actually good it tips. can be good to be. I was a, a little, pizza delivery boy. There you go. What are you most proud of? What's uh, one of the things you're most proud of? I'd love to know that. Wherever you interpret that. One of the things I'm very proud of is starting the company Soul Pancake. I was just speaking about it earlier today at another event, and I was just realizing, like, there's so many... Uh, Annabella, your director, got her start at Soul Pancake. I remember the first date that she was hired and going around with a clipboard, taking notes. And uh, Justin, some of your earliest work was... Uh, at I'm Soul Pancake. Soul, it was, I'm, Soul Pancake is a huge part of my and life. And so we created a, a digital media company that makes uh, uh, uplifting content that brings people together, diverse stories. And uh, we were one of the very first people kind of doing this kind of work. And I'm really proud that I helped launch that and launch a lot of great careers. Uh, not launch careers, but okay. give a give a, seed, a mm -hmm. seedling you know uh opportunity he takes complete responsibility for all mm. my success he's told me oh like right. you do absolutely. me absolutely yeah like my wife and my kids and every time it's like oh, yeah, how'd you meet your wife oh yeah through you thank you <laughs> i'm just curious yeah, yeah. So every just, time just, a kid <laughs> comes of mine you're like oh you can thank me for that kid huh <laughs> anyways it is what you did was uh so ahead of its time and has has changed a lot of people's lives. But yeah. that wasn't the question I was interested in, though. That's great. Oh, blah, shoot. That's, that's like okay. blah, blah, blah. Great, great, great. <laughs> okay. Great, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> you want a personal one? Yeah, I'm curious. What's interesting to me is I asked you what are you most proud of in your life and you talked about work, which is great. So it is wonderful. I don't want to take that away from you. Well, but, no, this is a good point. I'm going to hold up. But hold, what's hold interesting, on if I would ask another person, someone else might say their family or yeah. they might say such and such. And I was curious what you're, what you're, in, what you would have said. But, you know, we're, we're, Let's go there. We're unpacking Un masculinity. Yeah. So yeah. here's one of my issues is workaholism, which is a yeah. big mm -hmm. part of, you know, it's an accepted ah. male. No, it's not accepted. It's, it's, it's lauded. It's expected. It's mm. lauded, you know, like, oh, I married this guy. Oh, that's great. Mm. Yeah, he works 80 hours a week mm. as a an, on mm. a hedge fund. Oh, oh you must be so lucky. You must be so you know, lucky. Yeah. Um, he's not like a potter and yeah. he, you know, he stares into my eyes. Okay, you know? so let me re-ask it now. Okay. Abdul Baha sitting with you. Mm -hmm. And he says, Rain, what are you most proud of in your life? You make me cry. Um, no, uh, I think uh, my journey toward integrity and uh, m my work that I've done on my marriage. So mm -hmm. I would say that's yeah. what I'm most, really most proud of um, at the end of the day, you know? And coming back to workaholism, why do you think that so many, why do you think it's so rewarded for men and, and also something that so many men fall into? I, I think we inherit it. I think, uh, I think it's, it, it comes to us sociologically, you know, there's societal pressures mm -hmm. about what makes success. Um, and, uh, and then success being connected to self-esteem. Yeah. I mean, there was a very long period of my life that the entirety of my self-esteem, I'm talking about all of it, yeah. was uh, my success in work. If right. things were going well in work, then I felt good about myself. Mm -hmm. If things were going bad in work, then I felt bad about myself. Mm -hmm. So I've, it's been a long, part of this therapeutic process has been a long kind of untangling uh, mm -hmm. that. Like, can I feel good about myself not working, yeah. you know? And can I be working and have that not affect my self-esteem? Like, oh, get offered some big job and just be the same as I was when I didn't have the job. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So not kind of ride that that roller coaster. Um, so it's it's tricky because you want to have an occupation, you want to succeed, you want to um, uh, you want to provide for your family, you want to have a voice, you want to you know give something to the world. These are all positive male traits, mm -hmm. but in our contemporary society, there. Um, that has been toxified right. as well. I mean, you just yeah. pick up like Vanity Fair and those every issue, there's some like, here's some titan of industry yeah. who's like 
basically here's an here's an asshole. Here's our asshole <laughs> of the month, the cigar chomping <laughs> idiot who made a bazillion dollars, do, you yeah. know, creating, mm-hmm. you know, Tinker Toys or whatever right. it is. Mm-hmm. And and who's the woman behind every guy, right? I mean, most of them have kids, so who's taking care of your kids? Who's the person that allows you to be that guy? Or they're on their too. fifth wife, who's right. 27, right. Mm-hmm. and the the wife yeah. that got them there, yes, they jettisoned geez. when as soon as they That never 60. happens. Does that happen? Jeez. Oh, come on. <laughs> Oh, wait, it does. But this is a difficult conversation. Yeah. I'm really respecting this conversation because it's th- this ongoing conversation that you've entered into with your book, Justin, and um, and bringing these guests on because it's, you don't want to vilify men. Like after I said mm-hmm. that, I was kind of like, oh, I don't want to demonize, vilify men. There's so much I love about masculinity and, and men and males and, uh, you know, that should be kind of respected and honored and yep. uh, cultivated. Yeah. That's in your book mm-hmm. as well, obviously. And but at the same time, uh, some of this stuff needs to be dismantled. It's just right. not working yeah. anymore. I mean, I think mm. this is this is the big deal, is that the systems that uh, currently run the world have underpinnings of um, uh, all of this kind of uh, crap that is no longer serving us. So the political systems, economic systems, mm-hmm. environmental systems, food and agriculture systems, you know, workaholism, mental health issues, all of these, you know, healthcare, these systems are, are based on some really faulty premises that are usually based on self-interest, mm. competition, contest, uh, one-upsmanship, and the survival of the fittest. It's not working because our mm. society is deteriorating mm. and our earth is dying. So p- masculinity is inherent in all of those things. Yep. So it's a much bigger mm. topic than just like, hey, let's, how do we have a dinner with one another? Yeah. And that's important to discuss, but it's much, it goes much it deeper. It permeates yeah. every area almost of the world. And I think every issue can be pointed back. Yeah to it i mean you do Mm. so much climate activism and what's interesting with climate activism and recycling generally again i'm not hating on men this is the data i'm just i'm just the messenger but men are less likely to recycle than women and even there's really interesting data on tote bags that like tote bags are which is a recyclable you know reusable reusable bag are viewed as feminine so i'm curious you know being a, a climate activist and being a man in that movement do you see the way that our definition of masculinity limits uh the way that men can participate in that movement too yeah that's a great question i hadn't i hadn't really considered that but i'm sure that that's the case Mm. yeah i'm sure that's the case it has to do but again going back to even deeper than that if if it's everything is about survival of the fittest one-upsmanship and kind of personal independence and freedom and nothing kind of uh, getting in the way of my personal expression whatever that means Mm. then you're you're gonna bump up against walls. It 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 doesn't it rings hollow. It doesn't work anymore. Mm. Mm-hmm. And that like extraction at all costs, right? And um, that that sort of perspective of I mean, there's also really interesting data around men and risk, right? Like we think that men are these big risk, risk takers, and and women are the ones that are risk averse. And in many ways, it's true. But the way that we calculate risk is super subjective. When you switch the question around to, are you for uh, taking more risk when it comes to taxing the rich? Are you up for more risk in terms of more environmental policies? Then suddenly, women and people of color actually are far less risk averse and the people who are more risk uh, you know, averse are mm-hmm. actually white men. And so it's this interesting dynamic between Again, these old systems, right? These old ways of understanding things like risk, things like the planet, things like the environment, and that we kind of need to redefine all of those things. So uh, I was reading a little bit about Darwin the other day, and this whole idea of survival of the fittest did not come from Darwin. So it came from other social scientists that were uh, around just after Darwin who interpreted his evolution of species and origin of species work to mean survival of the fittest. But if you really look at what Darwin wrote, it really is could be called survival of the kindest yeah. Yeah. and that it's cooperatives yeah. that help each other move forward. And if a uh, human 
segment of the population succeeds or an animal one, it's because they're working in, in an interactivity and cooperation with others of the species or of other species mm -hmm. that allows them to rise and evolve. So mm -hmm. this idea like only the strong survive yeah. is, is bogus. Yes. For instance, mm -hmm. we always learned growing up that in the forest, the tallest trees are, are, are the winners and the, the shorter trees die. Well, that's not true because there's this uh, my microbial no my mm. call my chondrial it's not oh, yeah 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 it's the, oh, it's the mushroom the mushroom the fungal yeah. network mm. that, that fungal connects network. it connects the roots of these uh of these plants yeah. so that the tallest tree is sharing yeah. what it's getting from the sunlight with other mm -hmm. other plants and that they are it's far more communal it's far mm. more like james cameron avatar uh, mm -hmm. Kind of forest than we've ever. Did you watch that fungi before. documentary? Mm -hmm. I did. Yeah, it was amazing. Was, was, like, was cool. it not magic? I don't know. I didn't watch that one. Uh, all right. Before we jump off, I want to just uh, I want to ask you a question about uh, being a man and aging. Because mm -hmm. you are a little bit older than me. Not much. I'm a lot older. Little, than you. You're older than me. Well, you're older than Jamie. So he's, yes, he's, you're he's a lot older than me. Um, uh, yeah. You're like way older than me, aren't you? Yeah, way way older. And I'm yeah. and I'm curious. You know, you, you talked earlier about how there was periods of your life where your self-worth was mm. entirely dependent on whether or not you were working. Mm -hmm. So then there comes a point where, especially in our business, but I think every man experiences a version of this. I think back to like Willie Loman, right? And the salesman and, and you, you might reach a point where things aren't coming to you anymore. Um, have you thought about the aging process as a man and like, you know, what happens if you don't get offered things and, and, and how do we as men build ourselves up and our confidence and our self-worth and our assuredness to not have it be dependent on those external factors, to not have it be dependent on whether or not somebody's calling me to hire me or you get offered, you know, the rocker yeah. too. Yeah. <laughs> no one wants to see that. <laughs> um, the rocker too. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, I have uh, insurance for this. So I have taken <laughs> care of uh, this issue because I have purchased a kiln. A what? A, a kiln. kiln. I've purchased a kiln. That's for pottery. Justin doesn't know what a I kiln is. I have no is. idea what a kiln is. <laughs> you didn't know either? No, I okay, don't I feel know. better. I was like, okay. am I the only person that doesn't know what a kiln is? It's, it's a big, big thing, oven but... that you bake your pottery in. Fun. All I can think about is that scene from Ghost and you and Holiday doing that now. Yeah, you guys. No, uh, no. I don't, I don't need never to. Never happened. No. I don't need to make pots, but I want to make ceramic things, and so I'm just gonna go into my garage and I'm gonna make pottery things. That's what I'm gonna do in my old age, and then if they want me to act, I'll come act. But um, if you want me on your <laughs> stupid like podcast, I'll come over. <laughs> he just probably wouldn't be on your podcast. Stupid. <laughs> stupid podcast. <laughs> so can we can we just talk about um, the thing that you're known? For that, you know, the bobbleheads everywhere, the office a little bit. Liz is a massive fan, massive fan. I also feel like Dwight Schrute, we were talking about male friendship. Like, is Dwight Schrute actually really good at male friendship? Do we think that his desire for face to face with Michael? Can you channel and... him for a second and answer the question? Is Dwight? <laughs> Like, you know, like those people channel like, Abraham. Would, yeah, if I would ask Dwight Schrute about masculinity, <laughs> what would what would he say? Do you think he... <laughs> do you think he is reaffirming those negative things about masculinity or do you think he's sort of breaking the mold? That is so funny. It's such a funny question to think about. I've never thought about Dwight Schrute in terms of mm. masculinity or <laughs> man enough or toxic masculinity or anything like that because... <laughs> Um, and, and I think it's one of the great things about Dwight is you can never really put your finger on what makes him tick. Like mm. as soon as you think like, oh, he's kind of a know-it-all bully, then yeah. all of a sudden he's kind of crazily vulnerable. Yeah. And then he's kind of, oh, he's a nerd. And mm. then all of a sudden he's driving a muscle car. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, <laughs> listen, he's got his farmer friends. He's got his giant Amish family. Um, you know, farm. he's, he's going to, you know, be shooting crossbows with his friends <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> out in the fields and also playing Dungeons and Dragons, stuff like that. I think what Dwight does really well is kind of play up this kind of like, yeah, kind of rural, mm -hmm. semi-suburban mm. image of a man of like, he's a salesman and he's a workaholic and a farmer and he drives a muscle car and stuff like that. But it's always collapsing. It's always mm. kind of falling down around him. He's, mm. he's the butt end of is it's, mm. it's the butt end of jokes and yeah. um mm. and he and also like you mentioned like his his longing for approval from michael, michael. and his love and loyalty yes. to michael is so like 
it's so sincere it's yes. so deep and true yeah. like he would die for him and there's yes. something really kind of And he beautiful. would like to die for him. Yeah. Like, I feel like it's not even just like, I would do it if I had to. Like, it would be his honor. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. Let me. Let yeah. me. Can I? <laughs> yeah. And that, yeah. like, do you think Dwight was really good at friendship? Like, male, like should we all kind of look a little bit to Dwight in that respect? Oh, Only? where is this interview going? <laughs> well, when you meet some of his friends in some of the later seasons, That's I'm not true. sure That's, that. Right. There's some, uh, there's some mm -hmm. real wackos. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but he learns, you know, and he, he, him and Angela had their ups and downs yeah. and then he's able to fully commit and they have yes. Philip and, uh, they, uh, he's a, he's a dad and a husband mm -hmm. and, and he ends the series, sorry, spoiler alert as manager. So yes, I think there's some, some nice he man did. lessons yeah. that could be learned from he Dwight He took Schrute. a journey. He yes, took a journey. He did. Right. Dwight took a journey. Thank you, Rain. Thank you for that beautiful feminist analysis of Dwight Trude. I really, really appreciate right? it. Right? Yeah. It kind of holds that, up. That's a, that's I feel like whole... there's a research paper waiting oh, to happen. Oh, oh yeah. I I'm, actually want to hear you. I want to yes. see you write I'm gonna an op-ed somewhere about yes. Dwight, Dwight Schrute, Schrute, the feminist that hero. That is good. Mm -hmm. feminist we did, mm -hmm. The feminist hero we didn't know we needed. Yep. That yeah. is good. I'm on it. Indeed. All right, rapid fire? Yeah, let's, let's do, do the it. rapid fire. Okay. Welcome to this week's Man Enough podcast rapid fire questions. When's the last time you lost at chess? Um, uh, Probably a few weeks ago to you. All right, yeah. good. Yeah. Oh, Next interesting time. question. A little masculinity competition. Mm. We do have an ongoing chess competition. We've played 2,000 games what? of chess or something like that. I think he's won like seven more games than me. It's crazy Pretty even. Close. It is really even, but who's got more? You have more. Thank you. You okay. win. Next, wow. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. Next round of questions. <laughs> uh, we're in the future and you are a ghost at your own funeral. Mm -hmm. What do you hope is said about you as the way you move through the world as a man? Uh, wow, that's a really profound question. Um, uh, I, I guess I really hope that uh, people think or uh, see or that I have made a difference in the world. So just like this person made a difference. Um, that's That's what it would... That's what it would take. And what me. do you hope that Walter says about you? Um, I hmm. hope that he uh, feels that I was some kind of somewhat viable role model for him. So we'll see. Who knows? <laughs> and Rain, will you, um, before we wrap up, you do some amazing work in Haiti. Uh-huh. You just, um, just share a little bit about it real quick. Yeah, so uh, Holiday and I started a, a, a company, a, a nonprofit called Lide Haiti. Because uh, we were in Haiti right, right before and right after that devastating earthquake uh, in 2010, and uh, so we do uh, women and girls education, uh, arts education, literacy, scholarships. We have a mobile computer lab. We do a healthcare and have a food program, and we're working with 800 girls in about 11 locations. And um, it's really, 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 really hard. Um, but it's pretty great and we employ a lot of Haitians and empower a lot of Haitians and it's a completely Haitian run organization. Wow. Emily wow. was, uh, your first volunteer, I think. Yeah. One of our very first, My to wife come Emily. Down. your wife came down and, and taught the arts and, and drama. And yeah. you recently just lost your co-founder. She just passed on. Yes. Dr. Catherine, Catherine. Adams was a co-founder and she passed away from cancer just a few months ago. That was, uh, so, was devastating. We appreciate that work you're doing. Brother. Please, uh, please uh, check it out, mm -hmm. Um All right, uh, final question. What does it mean to you to be man enough? Um, I guess it means uh, a balancing integrity with vulnerability. Mm. Mm. Does that sound all right? Like That's that. just what came to mind. Mm -hmm. Sounds like a man who's learned some things. Mm. I've been around the block, Jamie. Yes, yes, yes. I love you. Thank love you for you doing too. this, brother. I uh, love you, brother. We will be right back with a recap with Liz and Jamie. Thank you for listening to Man and I. Hello, and welcome back to Man Enough. I'm Justin Baldoni here with Jamie Heath and the amazing Liz Plank. Can we just get straight into the fact that Liz is a super, super rain i didn't realize how big of a rain fan, fan she yeah. was i was uh, hiding it, it was so that you would let me in the room <laughs> and i and i want to confess i had i felt a tinge mm -hmm. of jealousy yeah rain was asked 
to be uh, on Liz's TikTok and mm. take selfies with Liz and things. And I have admired Liz's TikTok. In fact, Liz taught me TikTok, and she's never asked me to be in a TikTok. Oh. And so I just, I just was oh. like noticing the like. I you know. am afraid to ask you to be in a TikTok. Okay. I, I feel I feel. Wait, like wait. So I make it, you feel fear? Well, because you have such a big presence and you have a, such a specific like. I don't. That was Rain Wilson. I know, but also we didn't do TikTok. <laughs> that was a that's called a selfie. Um, I know, but, 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 but no, no, but but, did, but I feel like you said like you passed it off on like you said something about TikTok and I then said we should you do like TikTok. lobbed it and then right. he didn't really respond. Well, it. In fairness, I said we, and I really meant, I didn't meant mean oh, me and Ryan, I would have been included I meant we, oh, all of okay. us. Because I'm always, it. we is, is, there's no I in this. Oh. It's, it's all of us. There's no I in man. So Neither I've, one of you have asked me to do any TikTok or right. Instagram or selfies, not once. Not one. Day. You've been in every selfie. No, no, no. This is, no, I'm, here's the thing. You know, we've been busy. We've been busy. Yeah, we've been okay. busy. All right, Talking. so we just had Rain Doing Wilson. We just, had, we just Rain. had Rain Wilson. And on. he yeah. broke and, some straight stuff down. And the most important thing I think we got from that entire episode is that there is a possibility that mm -hmm. Dwight Schrute mm -hmm. is the ideal man. Is the is the male mindful masculinity. He, he is the poster boy for man enough. Mm. He is. He, I think we should rethink your book cover. I think. Well, I, that's what I was thinking about. Dwight I was like, man, Trude. we should have transformed him into Dwight and had him look at the camera and say, yes. like, I'm, I'm Justin now, don't I? I know I missed a huge shit. I missed a huge. We should have him send us, a, send us something. Like he's got, like to dress him up as. Yeah, that, I think that would have got us all the downloads. Oh that's my it. gosh. Uh, well. What did you take away from that conversation? So many things. I, I think Rain was so. They they say don't meet your heroes, but mm. I'm glad I I did meet Rain, and um, I thought his humility was so. Uh, powerful in all of his answers. Like he was never like, I got this figured out as you, um, you know, mm -hmm. talk so much about the book about like, I'm not, I, I, I'm figuring this out. And I thought that was really wonderful. I loved um, his uh, take on the planet, uh, mm. generally speaking, <laughs> and the fact that we should save it. And That'd yeah, be a good thing. Just, He's big on that. Yeah. And, and Darwinism, like thinking about it as a class, because that's true, by the way. Mm. Darwinism, you know, we think about science as like, what's well, science? So that's just the way it is, right? But it's interpreted, right? And yeah. who interprets science? Uh, mostly not men. people of color, mostly not women. White men. Right? And so it's interpreted in a certain way. And so Darwinism, he talked about how, you know, it's not the survival of the fittest, it's the survival of the kindness. Darwinism is also not the survival of the fittest. It's the survival of the most attractive. It's like who wants to be, mm. who wants to reproduce with you. So if you mm. are kind, mm. if you are compassionate, if you are loving, you are actually going to make it mm. in Darwin's uh, world. And it's not about dominating. It's not about being the biggest dick. It's actually about being like. So where's the, the nice guy? guy from, where's with? the nice guy? Nice guys finish last thing come from. Let's from like the patriarchy, man. This is all coming. Like it's all lies, right? Like, don't. Where do? When's the first time you heard that? That nice guys finish yeah. last. You um, probably were super young. I think it, I. That's actually a great question. I think it. For me, really it was it was really young, and it, and I think it had to do with, it was in relationship to other girls. Like I think it was being maybe I was being that's true. I, I, uh, you know huh. I was being friend zoned as the, as they called it and like girls did, did maybe saw me as a friend mm -hmm. and like another guy was like you gotta be a dick or something yeah no and I also that, got it in work settings as well right. nice guys finished oh, last totally. so you gotta like as yes. a leader as a leader as a leader yes. like uh yeah there's a we could there's yes. a whole episode we could do on that what else what else did we get with Ray yeah. are you asking me um. Any of us. I mean, uh, well, we know I, I him loved, a lot. So I love the 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 bromance happening. Mm -hmm. um, I love that how close uh, you, I mean, the three of you are, but also one on one. How he has really reached out to you in, in really intimate and and connecting mm -hmm. ways, but also like held you accountable, which is kind of what we you know we've yeah. been talking about, right? That this conversation um, around masculinity is about vulnerability but it's yeah. also about accountability and mm -hmm. it seems like in both cases he was like love you here for you yeah you're, you're kind of being a dick right now you're being or like or like you're, me, you're being right, an idiot you're being an idiot yeah and i think that's the perfect balance yeah right i mean that's what i want more from men mm. i also loved hearing that he didn't like when he was younger he didn't have memory of wanting to fit in 
Mm. Yes, I love that. With other boys and yeah. other guys. It's just crazy to me. I wanted to ask him about that because I don't, I don't know if I believe him. Oh, really? I mean, I'm not saying Ray's but, lying. But, well, maybe, and that's and that, that was kind of why I brought up the mm. idea that maybe it's because he self-identified as a yeah. nerd. Yes. And he was like, and he accepted it. Right. I think for a yeah. lot of young guys, like for me, I was in the middle, right? Mm. I, I was super athletic, but also I had... Oh my god! I just thought of something that you said to me, like two weeks ago. Oh yeah, I, was, I know exactly what it is. I was a dork, and I still am. Yes. Like, and so I didn't know where to go. Like, mm -hmm. I would have been. Ha I think I would have been happier and more content as a boy, a teen, and a man mm -hmm. if I would have embraced the theater geek in me. But, and I think I actually I, I read about this in my book. I. I was an athlete. I had to choose. I was forced to choose between whether or not I was going to be an athlete or a theater geek. Mm. And in the hierarchy of school, you know where you know what happens to theater geeks. And at my school in Oregon, which is so fucking brutal, like you get, we called it, it was a verb. You called it coked. You got coked because we had open campus. So you would walk to school or you'd walk from school to lunch. And it was like three, four blocks. There was like Burger King and Taco Bell and all the stuff we could always eat when mm. we were that age. And on that walk... The freshmen and the nerds who didn't have friends or cars would walk, and then the older upperclassmen would throw cokes at them, like Coke bottles. Like, like, the, like the they'd drink? go. It was. It's like a. They would go to the Seven Eleven and they'd get like huge, like you know, two liter, forty, yeah. like no, but just like a you know, not like a the paper bottle. cups, mm -hmm. but yeah. like the big. They fill them up and then they would toss them out their truck windows. And your goal if you were a nerd was to not get coked because then you'd have coke on you for the rest of the day and it, was, and it was like a traumatic experience that oh a lot of guys ex went through that was not that was not in my memory. no that was just that's what happens when you move to you know oregon uh oregon's <laughs> Damn, great oregon's there's great tough. parts of oregon. another thing i loved was when he talked about how open and vulnerable he was showing his son his imperfections and when he screws up that was he one of my favorite lot. parts he in fact he and i've talked about this over the years um because there's something will come up he's like what do you think you think i should share this with walter and i'm like no you can't I mean, this is like you know from my perspective Too it's much. not age appropriate and yet he still does wow. um because he would rather err on that side than the other but he, and he didn't say this it's not like too much for him he didn't he didn't say this directly but you can infer what we know about his dad that his dad never did that with him that's right because his dad he said like feelings emotions were mm -hmm. off limits it was tucked away in a lockbox. and so i think what he's doing is very similar to what my dad did mm -hmm. um my dad didn't show me those things so now that's why i'm going out of my way to show my kids and i love that rain's doing that yeah he's just a really really good dude good. i think we need a man enough shirt with Dwight Schrute's yes. face on it. We need merch. I mean, period. Need, That's like I, a whole I feel like you would wear that. I would wear oh that God. every day. <laughs> uh, if you like our show, please like and subscribe wherever you listen to your podcasts. Mm -hmm. And uh, thank you so much for listening. We'll see you soon. This is, is Man Enough. Man Enough.